This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to come up here. I've been enjoying for the last couple of years. I've been collaborating a bunch with uh, the Ryan Lab, and so that's been a lot of fun and a lot of interesting research thrusts. And, and so today's talk is to give you a little bit of a taste of, of some of the work we're doing in Beltsville, uh, uh, particularly in the development of, of high residue no-till grain production systems. Uh, we'll give you a, a, a taste of what's going on down there, try to link it to some of the, the things that are going on up here. Uh, reality is obviously we have some climatic differences, so we have a little more flexibility in Maryland with some of the work we do with corn particularly. Uh, so that, that's kind of why I focused on corn was because I think that'd be a little bit something new for you guys in, in this department, uh, these high residue no-till corn production systems where I, I, I take it you probably hear a lot about soybeans. So this is an ambitious title, and like in every ambitious title, not everything in the title might be in the presentation. So there's a <laughs> few little missing details just because uh, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, cover a wide swath of things. So, so we're, you know, not everything uh, in the talk is going to cover conventional and organic. In fact, most of it is going to be around conventional systems, uh, and I'll try to make some linkages to the implications in organic as well. So this is really what's been driving conservation for so long now, right? Uh, the Dust Bowl came, and since then there's been just a suite of various different strategies uh, in agriculture to, to conserve soil resources. And, and this has an, been an ongoing dialogue for some time now. Certainly, uh, no-till agriculture has been one of the, the dominant strategies to address uh, soil erosion and, 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 and to conserve those soil resources. Uh, organic agriculture has its own paradigm in which it tries to address soil conservation and the building of soil health as well. And, and so there's this kind of linkage between these two systems in that they're both very soil-centric and, and soil management-centric. Uh, No-till being this Cadillac in, in reducing erosion from the standpoint of you know, improving you know, water infiltration, uh, increasing uh, soil organic matter, uh, again, reducing the erosion. And obviously, why one of the reasons this has taken off so dramatically, and this is just a, a distribution of, of no-till ground in the country, and the, this is 30% for the Mid-South, so this is 30%, and these regions here are 25 to 30%. Reason this has taken off so rapidly is because farmers can dramatically save the amount of time the amount of labor, uh, they can cover fields really rapidly with machinery. They're not, you know, they're not running machinery through the soil, and so that's certainly been a huge advantage. Uh, but there's there's a challenges associated with no-till agriculture. Um, if you look at this fig this uh, map here, this is a map of herbicide resistance. You know, so this is particularly glyphosate resistant species across the U.S. Uh, well, and actually part of Canada. And if you look. This tracks pretty closely to the areas that are dominated by no-till agriculture, right? So, so there's this paradox in, in, in our management between practices that really conserve our soil resources uh, with practices that um, pr uh, result in some new challenges, new, some new management constraints. And so while we're really excited what we can do with no-till agriculture, uh, herbicide resistance, for example, has really challenged our current worldview when it comes to no-till agriculture. And so how do we address that? And, 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 and look at, you can just see the rise over the years in the amount of unique cases of herbicide resistance. So it's, it's, a, it's a real issue for conventional agriculture. And in the state of or, in organic agriculture, weeds are also a, a real problem in that system. And, and particularly as organic producers who historically have not been reduced till or no-till start to try to reduce tillage in their systems, weeds become even more problematic. So weeds really are at the center of this challenge in, in conserving soil resources in both of these types of systems. So the typical approach, right, is to diversify our chemistries, stack genes. That's kind of historically how we've tried to address resistance. And that's certainly a very important aspect of weed control and moving forward with herbicide resistance issues. Uh, but there's other strategies. There's a lot of folks emphasizing integrated weed management practices. And this is by no means a laundry list, but it gives you a, a, some a sample of the types of practices that we target to uh, both address weed concerns in the system while trying to conserve some of these practices like no-till agriculture. And so the remainder of my talk is really going to focus on these types of practices and how we can uh, particularly manipulate cover crops in the system to uh, you know, enable us to continue 
towards these, uh, no, these goals with soil conservation and no-till agriculture. Of course, no talk would be complete without mentioning cover crops, uh, without going through all the list of services that they provide. Certainly not a laundry list, but it, uh, there's a wide range of services that cover crops provide. They're multifunctional tools, and that's why they fit well into kind of these no-till systems or as a way of kind of helping to uh, inhibit or suppress weeds, um, as well as provide another a number of services in the system. So this is what we've been focusing on for a number of years. And when I say we, really, this has been a collective effort uh, for some time now. Uh, folks throughout the whole Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region have had a really great synergy and interactions in the development of these high residue no-till systems. Many folks at, at Cornell have been key players in this. Is certainly, I know a big influence to everything I've done in these systems and all the work that we've done over the years have really come from uh, Chuck's early work with John Teasdale and all of those uh, questions they asked related to how different mulch elements suppress weeds. And so what you're seeing now is kind of where we've been taking that work and how we've been trying to operationalize that into production, uh, grain production systems. And so we've been historically using a lot of rye and soybean systems and hairy vetch and corn. This varies. There's a lot of interest in other cereals and other legumes for a number of reasons. But I'm going to just focus on these, uh, these two cover crops today and looking at them as in monoculture and in mixture. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this piece of equipment at this point by now. And this is simply a tool that has helped really operationalize our ability to do uh, uh, high residue no-till production systems with cover crops because it's, uh, it's a way of, of rapidly knocking down cover crops and enabling us to uh, plant cash crops behind that. And whether or not you're spraying your cover crop and then rolling it down to, to make a, a mulch that suppresses weeds, or whether you're killing it uh, effectively with a roller crimper in an organic system, both have the same implications in the standpoint of, of creating this, this uniform uh, mulch mat. And this just gives you a, a, a taste of what some of this looks like and, 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 and the kind of residues that we're working with. So what I'd like to first do is talk a little bit about the equipment end of things. That's really where a lot of the learning has been over the last decade. We've implemented a, a host of biological studies looking at interactions between weeds and cover crops and cover crops and fertility management. But one of the, the constraints that's really made it difficult for us to take this from something that we're evaluating on a research station to recommending to producers is our ability to get uh, uniform populations of, of our crops in the field and regardless of the conditions of the cover crop. And so I'm just going to briefly review some of those approaches. Uh, so we, we certainly find planters to be much more effective than drills. You have less steel that's going through the field. And so you, you can get better downward pressure. And, and the planter certainly has better simulation of seed and placement of that seed. And so that's been a big step forward for us. Where early years, we we're focusing on with drills, particularly with soybeans. Soil moisture content and weight is a huge component of the efficacy of our ability to cut residue and get seed into the ground. And so that's something that we've looked at a lot over the years. When the residue is too wet, sometimes it's hard to, to cut and it can get pushed down into the ground. And that particularly applies to the soil. If the soil is, is really wet, then it's not firm enough to provide that resistance to get good cutting action with our coulters. And so there we don't get good cutting of the residue. When you don't cut the residue, the planter just rides up on the ground and you deliver a nice row of seeds all along the surface of the ground and you don't get your crop. So, this is a, a real big issue. Uh, residue quality, I, I just mentioned a little bit about that. So we've been playing a lot with timing of rolling, with timing of planting, and the combinations of those practices. I'm not really going to focus a lot on that in this talk, but uh, we have a number of papers over the years that have come out to that have addressed that issue. And we feel like we have a better handle now on just the, the interaction between when we kill and when we plant, and what the residue quality needs to be, and what the soil conditions need to be. Coulter types, generally we've been focusing mostly with on, on using these type of ripple or bubble coulters. Anything that has a wavy fluted edge on it just creates more surface area to go through that residue and, and more cutting action that has to occur. And so there haven't been really effective. Uh, folks like these different bubble or ripper, ripple or straight coulters for various reasons due to soil texture and, and, and uh, what they're doing in their individual operations. But generally you want a straight edge on that end to get good cutting. 
Closing wheels have been another, is another issue that we've dealt with over the years. And what we're moving towards is more of these curved tines coupled with like either cast iron or rubber uh, uh, discs because we get not only better closure, but you get some crumbling more of the soil so that you get more seed to soil contact. So that's kind of the name of the game in this, right, is, is both being able to cut through the residue. That's goal one. And then after you cut through that residue, being able to uh, get good firming and seed soil contact around your crop seed. And so these are some of the new planters now that we're, we're working with. We're working with planters that have trash wheels like these shark tooth out in the front to either totally remove or just partially remove the residues in the front of these coulters. And then we have these heavy residue slicers that come in behind that to cut that residue to make sure that it's clean. And then we let the normal planter configurations, which is back here, do their usual work. And they're not dealing with the same amount of residue as these front units are. And so we basically add another toolbar in front of our planter just to address these issues. OK, enough with the uh, machinery talk. I'm not an ag engineer, so I, I don't have a lot more to say about that. That's some of the discoveries that we've had over the years. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about the biology and, and uh, particularly focus on <clears throat> managing cover crops for improving the uh, persistence of the residues that we have out there at, uh, for better weed suppression and then trying to improve our nutrient management. And that's really been the challenge in corn. It, with soybeans, we're all focused on just getting big cereals out there so that we can suppress a lot of weeds and we have a, 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 fixing, a, a nitrogen fixing cash crop. So nitrogen isn't, isn't an issue for us. Really when we're balancing both nitrogen and weeds in these systems, regardless of whether they're conventional or organic, uh, that's when it becomes a bit more challenging. And so that's why there's been a lot of interest uh, in combining cover crops. You know, you can get the benefits of grasses, which are highly weed suppressive. They don't produce a lot of nitrogen uh, with uh, legumes that do produce a lot of nitrogen, but are not as weed suppressive. And so th the focus uh, on, on combining these into mixtures and trying to identify what are these optimal co configurations, depending on your production, your production goals is, is a big part of getting optimal performance out of our cover crops and having a consistency from year to year. So uh, these are the, the themes that I think are important to cover from your ideal cover crop mixture for no-till corn, right? We want something that is gonna produce a lot of biomass, so both it has the potential for suppressing weeds, but that it also produces a lot of biomass and which translates into more nitrogen content. Uh, that it, you know, slow res uh, residue decay, which also translates into better synchrony of the release of that nitrogen with crop uptake. And so I'm going to kind of cover these different themes now in the next set of slides. So this is an experiment which we established in, we've had about uh, four years of this experiment, and we've conducted this, and we're, it's done now, we're not, it's, it, we just finished it last year. And uh, we did this on two replicated sites that have fairly similar soil types. We did this on a, a certified organic field that's been certified organic since 2000. And we did it on a site that receives a lot of the kinds of uh, diverse amendments and, and cover crop practicing uh, and has similar crop rotations but is managed conventionally. So they have a lot of similarities in their management history, the commodities that are in those systems, like a corn, soybean, wheat rotation. Uh, and, and, and in this, in this uh, in these two sites, we created a, essentially a continuum of cover crop uh, mixture proportions. So here is our, our cover crop mixture proportions from a 0% uh, percent, uh, vetch all the way to 100% vetch and vice versa, the 100% uh, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, doing that wrong here. So this is 100% vetch and this is 100% rye. And these are just in a replacement series design based on uh, maximum seeding rates uh, of the monocultures. And so first, let's look at some of the biomass. So here, we these are collected in half meter squared frames. Uh, and they were, they're collected actually in every single fertility treatment, which I haven't described yet. So there's a whole host of fertility treatments layered on top of this. And we took cover crop data for every one of those points. So our biomass that you're looking at right now is a tremendous amount of, of samples that are in those because the fertility treatments haven't been imposed yet because we haven't killed the cover crop uh, yet. But we're, so when we're taking that biomass samples, we have a quite a bit of a data that goes into these figures. And so what I want to introduce you to is just a, a simple replacement series design where you're looking at, in this case, a hairy vetch cereal rye seeding rates. So these are our categorical treatments. These are actual just treatments that we imposed out there. And you're moving from 
uh, 0 to 100% vetch. And you can see here, here's the vetch going up. Here's the rye going up this direction. And this is the total biomass. So we're going to look at this in a little bit more. That was exactly what I shouldn't do. There we go. Um, so this is a, a, a model that has had a lot of uh, use over the years to look at plant interactions and plant competition. It's a DeWitt model. Uh, if you want more details about this model, you can look here. I'm not going to go into every aspect, the nuance of this model, but just conveying that essentially you're looking at how these species perform in monoculture as, as compared to the, how they behave in mixture and then the interactions of those uh, uh, across these different seeding rates. And then the total model represents the addition of these two independent models. So again, vetch is going up, rye is going to the left, and this is our monoculture biomass of rye, and this is our monoculture biomass of vetch, and this solid line represents total biomass. One of the reasons folks use this kind of design is because it, it is, is a useful way for looking at overyielding. So do the uh, combination of these two cover crops produce more biomass than the, the sum of the parts, so to speak. And, and so there's a, a lot of interest in, in overyielding for a number of reasons, and like such as in polycultures, intercropping systems, and in this case, we're looking at it in the case of cover crop performance. And so now all I've done is just taken that one figure and show you the extent of the data sets we have. So this is the North Farm, our organic site, which tend to have much higher uh, uh, soil fertility, or uh, at least uh, typically does, than on the South Farm, which again, similar soil types, but um, uh, one is conventional, one is organic. And what you're looking at here are uh, three site years of data done uh, where both of these different cover crops were established about very similar time frame uh, in, in fields that are not very far apart. So climate is not very different between these fields. Uh, but what I really want to cue you into is just look at how strikingly different the behavior of the species are. We're, like for example, here where hairy vetch is not very competitive early on and there's a real lag and rye is extremely competitive and dominates compared to a, a system like this where vetch is increasing biomass rapidly. So there's a lot of factors that go into cover crop performance. And I think you know, there's a lot of things we can, we can talk about in this figure. The key points here, just that where these plus signs are, were years where we saw over yielding. But what I really want you to cue into is just how much variability there is in these six site years. And there's a lot of factors that go into cover crop performance. And when we're trying to get producers to use cover crops, you know, a big issue with using cover crops is the consistency and precision in which you can use these cover crops in your production system. And so part of using mixtures is a way of kind of reducing some of that variability because of the plasticity of the two species. But even within just these two species, you can just see on sites that tend to have a little bit more nitrogen, for example, such as, as these fields here where the rye really dominated, versus sites that were uh, a lower nitrogen levels, you can see big differences in just the growth rates of the individual species. Uh, now, we're taking this uh, uh, same uh, set of uh, samples and we're analyzing it for an, uh, nitrogen content. And so this is just one of those many site years that we were just looking at. And now we're looking at total end content. We're looking at end content in the vetch and end content in the rye. And this is across this proportion gradient. But now, whereas before we had categorical treatments, now we're using the raw data, whereas the biomass that we actually harvested out in the field, that just because we put out an 80, 20% mix of rye and vetch doesn't mean we ended up with exactly an 80, 20% mix. So this is the real distribution of, of biomass in, amongst those species in the field. And now let's kind of look at this um, point here. Uh, you can see that, and so this is monoculture legume biomass. And that's how much, nit I mean, nitrogen content, not biomass, sorry. So this is how much nitrogen we can produce with the legume in monoculture. And what I want you to look at is this region of missing information. So this isn't missing information. This is every year we put out these different experiments, and some years vetch biomass dominated more, and we were able to span that region. In other years, we didn't. And you can see how, how much l less vetch biomass that we had, and the rye tended to dominate. But what you can see is generally, despite that, at our 50% mixtures, or when we start to get above a certain threshold, we notice that 
this, this solid line, that's the total nitrogen of the entire cover crop, that tends to be equivalent to your legume biomass in monoculture, and the legume nitrogen content in monoculture. So the idea is you're trying to find that threshold where the end content in your mixture is equivalent to the end content in your monoculture of your legume. And so when we look, go back to this same set of slides, now here's the all six site years. In this data set, as well as data, published data sets uh, all over the country, we did a meta-analysis. This was presented at the last Tri-Society meeting of mixtures versus monocultures. And the trends that we see both in our data sets as well as across the literature are some key points that, uh, that I think are worth mentioning. One, we generally do see overyielding with mixtures of grass legume cover crops, particularly in this case, rye, hairy vetch. So we do tend to get that greater biomass production and mixture. And that generally, when your legume is 50% of the composition of the total biomass in mixture, that's when we get to about that threshold in total end content. And so just there alone, if we're asking, quite, if, we, if there's objectives with having more grass in the mixture, well, depending on what you're targeting, whether your nitrogen needs or weed needs, you might want to find yourself on a different part of this trajectory based on your, your management objectives. So that really will depend on a given farmer. And so what we're trying to do is just lay out the spectrum of potential that's out there. And, and producers would have to make those choices based on their needs. And what the major factors we found contributing to that, uh, this overyielding, uh, are, are really um, the proportion of the cover crop and seeding rate applied and GDD. And what was really interesting, most experiments that have overyielding of cover crops are not when they're doing a replacement series like us, where we're actually decreasing the seeding rate of one species for the uh, rate of another. A lot of folks who are working with mixtures are finding uh, this overyielding where they're having higher seeding rates than what would be the equivalent of a, a, a one species seeding rate relativized to the two species. So uh, summary with, with those uh, set of figures that we looked at, uh, you can achieve equivalent or greater biomass than monocultures. Cereal rye tends to dominate in our sites. Now maybe that's because we have a history of manure management, a history of cover cropping, and soil conservation in, in our research sites that we have a little bit higher mineral, mineral N than if you're going to some of your sandier sites or, 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 or uh, lower fertile sites. But generally rye dominates because of that excess nitrogen availability. And again, what I mentioned about the plateau at 50% hairy vetch biomass. So now uh, we follow this up with a decomposition study looking at the release of uh, uh, the decay of that cover crop biomass as well as the release of nitrogen into the soil. And so here we're using litter bags to do that. And um, these are the proportions we targeted. So slightly different, before we were looking at six different cover crop mixtures, we replaced some of them and just went to 25, 75s and 50, 50s because um, it's a lot of work to do these litter bag studies. So I'm going to introduce you to an exponential decay model. Many of you are familiar with this. This is one of the most common models that we use in agricultural sciences. For those of you who are not, uh, Q into both the P and the K, because those are the two coefficients that, really, that we're, that we're going to be talking about quite a bit. Uh, this is somewhat almost of a double exponential. So for those of you who are not familiar, the main exponential model, decay model is right here in this kind of allows for some slower pool decay that um, I'm not going to go into much discussion about that. But, but just to give you a little taste so folks have an understanding of what they're looking at here, if you hold k constant, which is our decay rate, and you vary p, this is our pool size. So the, the, distance, the, the difference between these asymptotes represent the pool size, whether that's the pool of nitrogen or the total amount of biomass that was lost from the system. Um, that's our pool size. And so that's what happens when you vary p. When you vary k, that affects the shape of that decay, the rate of decay in, in this model. And so what the next set of models we look at are you're going to see differences in p and k. And that's what's driving the differences in the relationships of these cover crop in their biomass decomposition and end release. So here, you're, you're starting to get familiar uh, with uh, uh, the, the various different data sets we have here. This is the cereal rye at the top. This is hairy vetch at the bottom. So this is just a decrease in cereal rye and an increase in hairy vetch as you go down. And as you'd expect, as you increase hairy vetch into the mixture, you have a faster decay rate, or you have a greater amount of decay, 
that mat for that matter. And so what we're generally seeing is an increase. As you increase hairy vegetable proportion, you have an increase in the proportional lost. And so that proportion lost is P. So that's just the total amount of biomass in this case. And another slide would be the total amount of nitrogen. We also find uh, that as you increase hairy vegetable proportion, the you have an increase in the rate of loss. So in this case, you both have a rate and, uh, and a pool size change in the decay of these cover crops across these mixtures. Um, and we have a fair amount of variability, as you expect, from year to year. And uh, we're, this, this kind of work, we're actually working with um, the, the Adapt N folks and Jeff Malconian on, on uh, calibrating some of the models using Adapt N to estimate nitrogen release and uptake. And so this is the kind of issue that we have to address, that there's just annual variations, right? That, that this, this year, you had faster rates of decay than this year. And as you might expect, there were differences in precipitation that year. So we had just, it was just a little bit more moist out there. Cover crops decay better when they're wet than when they're dry. And, and so being able to build models that incorporate uh, this type of variability is important so that we can make models that would be able to extend across broad regions and useful for estimating end release. OK, now we're going to look at uh, synchrony of release with crop demand. How, how are we doing time-wise? OK, good. All right, great. So now we've, we've looked at how cover crop composition affects biomass, the nitrogen content, and even its, its uh, uh, decomposition of the biomass. Now we're going to look at some of the nitrogen dynamics. So one of the reasons why we're so interested in release rates and decomposition of cover crops and how we manage cover crops may influence those rates is because we're trying to increase our use efficiency of nutrients in our system. Generally, all, any good you know, uh, sustainable and, and conservative uh, corn management uh, system is going to target trying to improve nitrogen use efficiency. So the amount of nitrogen you put out in the landscape, you recapture as much as that as possible back into that cash crop. And so in the case of corn, you can see when it starts to reach exponential uptake of nitrogen. That happens around at V5, V8. And so that's why we have a standard practice in conventional agriculture to side dress our corn and split our applications amongst nitrogen put down at starter versus at side dress so that we're not dumping all our nitrogen out in the field when there's nothing to take it up. And, and, and we, we lose a lot of that nitrogen early in the season. And what's interesting is that you know, we are always so focused on good synchrony of N with, with our crop uptake from mineral fertilizer standpoint, but I we really understate how much available nitrogen comes from a legume from the moment that it's, it's terminated. It, it releases nitrogen very rapidly, and we have lots of nitrogen uh, leaching concerns and, and, and potential coming from a legume. So that's why these mixtures really provide a lot of opportunity to manage that. And so here again, you're looking at, uh, you don't have, rye is not modeled here, because we, we couldn't fit a model to that, because there really was no uh, uh, change in, 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 in um, and that And that could be both a combination of, of and uh, not, no loss of nitrogen, or what, what's more common to happen is, is not only are you losing some nitrogen from the rye, but rye is also a sink for uh, fungal-mediated nitrogen translocation from the soil into the mulch above the ground. And so the nitrogen is somewhat cycling and, and stored in there. Uh, but you can see between 2012 and 13, while we did have some differences, the big thing that stands out, obviously, is that the rate of, of release of nitrogen is really rapid in these monocultures, and that as we add grass into this mix, we delay the release of that nitrogen. Now, we're not just delaying the release of that nitrogen, we're also doing something else. We're, we're decreasing the pool size, right? So that these, this, this, is, this is our decay constant, but this is our pool size. And so while we're slowing down the release of nitrogen to get better synchrony, we're reducing how much nitrogen that's going to the cash crop, which poses a management challenge, right? Because we want to hit our yield goal and make sure we have enough nitrogen out there. In this case, though, increasing hairy vegetable proportion uh, resulted in an increased proportion of end loss. But whenever we had a grass and a legume together, there was not much of a change in the rate. So the pool size differed, how much we, total nitrogen was released, but the rate of release was, 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 comp, was similar. And this is really just a repeat of what I just said. So increasing hairy veg composition in the mixture, 
resulted in a proportion of mass loss, so the P, a proportion of N loss, so both that, that, again, that P constant, and then the rate of mass loss during corn growing season. So that's just the biomass had a decay rate difference, but not so much in the form of nitrogen release when legumes were with grasses in mixture. Now, this is just a yield response from across the mixtures. So this is no additional fertility applied, but you can see that we can get almost 90 bushels difference when going from a pure grass to a pure legume and our corn green yields. So the cover crops are certainly providing a huge impact on the performance of our cash crop. But as I mentioned before, particularly as we move towards mixtures that have a lot of advantages, we're reducing the amount of nitrogen in the system. And so we need more nitrogen. This can come in on a, a range of different sources for conventional producers. Uh, mineral uh, fertilizer is certainly the, the easiest option. Uh, putting down uh, so UAN is, is some of the treatments we do have in this experiment. I'm not going to highlight that. Uh, a big issue in our region, as is in your region, is animal waste. Uh, we deal with more poultry litter than you guys. You guys deal with dairy. But again, uh, that it's a big uh, management issue. And so getting a manure into the system to supplement the nitrogen needs uh, with, with our cover crop it was one of our objectives. Um, and, and you can see here uh, that these are being surface applied. When we surface apply, we lose a lot of our nitrogen in, in, in the form of it volatilizes. And plus, you also are, have some risk of, of er erosion as well. And so surface applications is, is, is really uh, you know, uh, been a, a, a challenge to get past. It's been decades worth of research and effort by both farmers and researchers to develop technology to address that issue. Uh, liquid dairy manure has certainly seen the, the, the fastest um, progression in that just because it's easier to work with liquids. In Maryland, this is really heightened for us because we have more and more restrictions coming out. For example, we have to now have any kind of animal waste incorporated within 48 hours of application. So there's a lot of interest in trying to incorporate animal waste uh, as, a, as a source of fertility rather than uh, applying it on the surface or applying it on the surface and incorporating through tillage just because of the obvious concerns we expressed about tillage. And so these are some of the prototypes that uh, folks have developed over the years to, to, to test this question. These are small plot units. This, can, this has been used in both pastures as well as production systems, mostly pre-plant type of applications. So we, we were kind of excited about that. You know, it, was, it seemed like some opportunity here. People are starting to work with poultry litter, these dry solids to get them incorporated. And so I kind of shopped around and looked at some products that, that might work for us. Uh, we're not ag engineers. We're not interested in, in, in developing ready technology for farmers to adopt. We're biologists, so we're going to test how this behaves, how we can increase use efficiency of nutrients, and, and what are the benefits of the system, and hopefully the ag engineers uh, will figure this out and, and make this work. And I know that this has been a challenge for a number of years. So this is, this is by no means uh, 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 a piece of machinery that's farm ready. Vegetable ready, yes, this would work great in vegetable systems. But we're just working with pelletized poultry litter because pellets are, are really easy to work with. They behave as far as decomposition kinetics, very identical practically to, to bulk litter. And so from a behavioral standpoint, it's a lesson to test our questions, but we're able to put out very precise uniform rates and uh, we're able to uh, ban this poultry litter. And the machine we built allows us to apply it at side dress. So whether or not side dressing poultry litter is going to become a regularly adopted practice or the focus is still going to be pre-plant, there's lots of logistical constraints to actually side dressing corn with poultry litter than, than just coming in at planting and, and uh, there's just a lot of management issues. But this is, uh, we wanted to continue to test that question of, of use efficiency where we're side dressing our poultry litter and take advantage of the types of management practices we know work with, with mineral fertilizers. And so this is what that looks like here. We've got Coulter cutting a trench that's slightly skewed. Uh, for, uh, it's on an angle, and so it creates a little trench as it drives through the field, and poultry litter is shot right down into that uh, trench, and then these clothing wheels close that up. And I kid you not, you walk into a field a couple weeks later, you don't even know where this unit went. I mean, the residue is all covered up. You can't see the, the disturbance, and, you, and you've just dropped down. Uh, we can drop down up, up you know, anywhere from uh, three quarters to, to uh, you know, five or six tons of poultry litter in an application rate with this machine. 
So this generated several research questions that link to this, these cover crop mixtures that, that I'm going to present on. Uh, uh, and so some of the questions that came out of this is just, you know, you know how does you know, side dressing this unit work? Can we, can it, will, will, it, will it affect the decomposition of the surface residues that we're getting a lot of benefits from? Um, and, and how does it, uh, it distribute it in the soil profile? And how does it behave over time? I'm only going to give you just a little glimpse of this work. We have a lot of work testing this question across a suite of different Management treatments, we're only going to look at a very subset of them. So now this is the additional methodology, but we're only targeting specific cover crops, so just the monocultures and the mixture. And we put down poultry litter in various different application methods where we broadcast it on the surface, and it, it, where, which is a typical practice historically, where you just put your poultry litter right over that cover crop, or apply it over the surface and incorporate it and manage like a tillage-based system. Our organic site, we managed it organically as you would tillage. The conventional was just a chisel till uh, conventional uh, uh, tillage-based system. And then we have all these subsurface banded treatments where we put subsurface banding at different rates and, uh, and then we have a no manure application. And so uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of this. If you have more questions about some of the treatments that I mentioned here, certainly approach me later in the day. Uh, so to understand just how that nitrogen is being released and to be able to quantify uh, the availability of nitrogen, now we have this whole spatial issue we've got to deal with. We've taken a broadcast rate and we've narrowed it down to these little bands. So the, the types of questions you have to ask related to how you would take a soil sample and, and test the, the, the release rates of nitrogen and what is available uh, uh, became a whole research thrust into itself. It was quite fun. So here we, we actually are doing depth structured spatial cores over the growing season of corn to see how that nitrogen is moving. And so this is what a core would look like. This is the band. And these are the number of soil cores that we've taken across that band. And then, you know, this, it's a mirror image to the left and to the right of that band. And so then those are compiled together and analyzed for inorganic nitrogen content. And then also we segmented these into these different depths. So we have a pretty good uh, resolution of nitrogen in that soil profile. And so then we developed a, a spatial model to assess nitrogen in, in f moving from that band. And so that had to both uh, incorporate the band effect, the cover crop effect, and the residual spatial dependence. And th I could give a whole talk just on this model and what we had to do. So I'm, I'm going to just be really quick. This is a diffusion model. Uh, we're using Euclidean distances to estimate um, uh, uh, nitrogen across that spatial profile. Um, and, and, and this is what that model looks like. There's a, fair number of other steps involved in, in, in this model to get to this point, but this is the pretty picture we want to look at to get a sense of how nitrogen is behaving spatially. This is just one site year. This doesn't include all of the other fertility treatments. This is just the poultry litter band that went down at side dress, and that's our rye, our hairy vetch, and that's our mixture. So these are just our three cover crops at five different growth stages of corn, and the band is done at side dress. So this is just the effects of the cover crop. And then as you see over time, the movement of the, of the nitrogen away from that band. And what I think is the most startling from our results, the nitrogen doesn't move very much. It doesn't move very much at all. We were expecting all sorts of, of, of issues related to um, vertical and horizontal movement that we would have to build into these spatial models. The reality of it is, is that a lot of this nitrogen is becoming available when the corn is starting to grow rapidly. And we see tremendous root proliferation around the band. And so the nitrogen is actually being taken up almost as rapidly as it's being mineralized from that poultry litter band. And so you're seeing very little movement away from the band. And uh, what's more, just coming back to that other figure now, what was really interesting is that we saw no difference from subsurface banding versus you know, no poultry litter whatsoever on the effects of cover crop decay. So not only are we getting very localized nitrogen when we ban that poultry litter and, and, and not a lot of movement from the band, but we're getting no impacts on the decay of our cover crops on the surface. And that's really important because when we're trying to manage our system and we're trying to know what our variables are, if we, the more interactions we have with our management, the more challenging it is to make decisions. So being able to know what's going on with the nitrogen in the soil and know that that's not having the same implications on, on, on nitrogen or, or mulch decay uh, allows us to make more precise uh, recommendations or farmers to make better decisions about their management. 
So summary of these findings, uh, surface banded poultry lure applications did not affect decomposition, as I mentioned. Uh, in fact, m all of this is really just a review of, of what I just said. So I'm going to just give you a, another little taste of, of some of the supplemental work we did around this. This is just a, one more piece of data. So on top of all this, we've created these, this continuum of cover crops and nitrogen availability and, and, and nitrogen source in the landscape. We, you know, we have all these different mineral sources and man manure sources and cover crops. So we know that that has a lot of implications on N2O emissions coming from uh, the, uh, the soil. And, 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 and certainly corn is one of our biggest players in N2O emissions. Uh, so it's, it's certainly an important place to test this question. And so um, I didn't really realize what I was getting into when we started this research, but uh, gre greenhouse gas measurements in N2O is, is quite labor intensive and, and exhausting. Uh, and most of the expertise that was involved in guiding uh, my graduate student and myself is, is coming from Michelle Cavagelli, who has been doing kind of greenhouse gas emissions in, in Beltsville for a very long time. Um, so here are the frames that we use that they, they span the distance from corn row to corn row. Um, and this is just an example of a sampling event. We do this year round. Anytime it rains, we're out there, whether it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever day of the week it is, the holidays. If it rains, we're out there the next day uh, sampling because that's what's driving N2O uh, emissions. And so just to give you a little taste of what that looks like. So now what you're looking at is different rates of poultry litter applied. And, and so this is our tillage treatment. So this is, and this, these rates, just to kind of cue you in, this is what we consider our P base rate. So kind of nitrogen applied at the P removal uh, level. And then this 135 is really our, our, our nitrogen, typical nitrogen base rate. And then this is rates that we apply that are actually not untypical in the, in the uh, uh, Delmarva at all, but, but uh, uh, it represents our kind of our saturated nitrogen levels. So we're uh, for either a very low fertile site or, or um, uh, just to help us you know, have an asymptote in the, in the data sets that we're looking at. And then this nine kilograms is just because in, the, in some of these organic systems, we're actually been experimenting with just putting down some pellets at planting. So we're actually running the, the fertilizer boxes, the dry fertilizer boxes open and dropping pelletized poultry litter at planting. And we're getting about uh, 500 uh, pounds of, of poultry litter put down at that point. That kind of gives you a rough equivalent of the plant available nitrogen that's coming. So this is a nitrogen gradient here of, of application rate. And this is just, uh, uh, this is basically no till and this is till. And what we also have in there is our bare ground. And then of course, Across this axis is our bare ground, our rye, our mixture, and our hairy vetch. This is, a, this is pooled for two years, so we didn't have a year interaction. So this is two complete years of greenhouse gas measurements measured, I mean, sometimes you know, in the upwards of 90 to 120 measurements in a year. Um, uh, and so this is a, a fairly uh, comprehensive look at how our fertility and our cover crop management drives greenhouse gases. And clearly, the things that stand out, obviously, is that you have more nitrogen in the system. You're going to get more N2O emissions. That's not rocket science. Um, what should be interesting to you is that the bare ground really comes down uh, as, the, as having the least N2O emissions. And there's a number of reasons. Obviously, there's, there's not some of the presence of, of carbon coming from sources of cover crops. Carbon is a very important component of, of N2O uh, uh, release and, and creating the conditions for N N2O uh, production. But then also, your, the soil dries out quite a bit more. You know, when you don't have a cover crop on the surface, you s retain soil moisture levels much higher, which are, are more conducive in conditions and environment for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But what was really interesting was that when you look at the amount of nitrogen applied in the form of poultry litter with the amount of nitrogen lost as N2O, while sure, the bare ground has its advantages from, from, from the standpoint of, of lower N2O, but there's also other implications of having you know, ground that dries out and, and not ha having those carbon amendments going back in. But clearly, the mixtures shine. We get a cover crop that can both supply the nitrogen we need for the cash crop, uh, it, it has a slower release rate, and it also reduces our N2O emissions as a function of fertilizer applied. So again, cover crops can increase into emissions. Uh, generally, uh, they respond in an exponential way, although you were looking at log transform data sets. And we have some you know, future plans of following up some of this work in these systems with some additional measurements. 
you only caught a little glimmer of these data sets and, and what we're kind of pulling together. And so kind of the next phase of this is to kind of do some multi-criteria assessments of these systems, looking at the various different factors and how they interact and kind of building a more uh, uh, complete data set. And also part of the work that we're doing here is working closely with Jeff in, in some of the models that he's developing. And that's been a really fun collaboration. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.